Hey everybody, it's Nick and Walker at Full Spectrum Laser and welcome to Laser Talk. What's up? Here we are once again. It's Wednesday, it's 4 o'clock. We're at Full Spectrum Laser and what else is there to talk about? But lasers. We Ooh. have a beautiful new background back here, if you see this, wow. made from a bunch of Ooh. things that used to be inside of lasers. Walker made this. This whole wall is going to be covered to look somewhat like Science Space Theater, Mr. Uh, Science Theater. 3000? 3000. Uh, you'll get it. Keep you know going. It um, so like that show that looked like it was in space, but made from a trash can. Yeah. <laughs> just, just kidding. So we're going to use a bunch of laser parts to redecorate the back of our set here. Keep looking out for that as we progress in the next few weeks. Uh, we got a bunch of fun stuff to talk about today on the show, right? We have so much stuff on the desk. Hey, what's this big thing you got in front of you right here? So we're talking rotaries today. Rotaries. What's this big one you got right here? So we have the Chuck Rotary. Um, and not a lot of people know about this guy. They know the traditional friction uh, rotary that we have right here. But uh, this both guy is kind of different. Absolutely. And both of these rotaries here, these larger ones, are for the pro machines. Correct? Yeah, they're both for the pro. And then we'll have a friction rotary for the hobby uh, that looks ex very similar. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but this guy is different because it's got these chuck jaws that open and close. We can show you, right, and as uh, we bring the cup over. Yeah. So the, uh, the teeth literally come on the inside of the cup and grab it like this. Yeah. Which, I mean, makes for such an easy You turn. see the clearance here yeah, for that handle. We can bring it up near the... Uh, I'll let you hold it out straight. Okay. Use the shoulder muscles. There we go. You see that clearance right here? That's what really makes a difference on that, uh, for sure. Yeah, especially and for cups and mugs like this, right? Yeah, now, you wouldn't get something like this for glass. Yeah. I tried. Believe me. Uh, it ended in, sh you know, pieces. Yeah. But this is good for uh, metal. Absolutely. So um, we actually marked this on in the cut, uh, which we'll put a link to the video up above. Uh, well, we Walker have a piece of that, don't we? Uh, yeah, we can actually play a little bit of it here, and we'll have the full video uh, to play. Do you have the in the cut of the um, cup there, Charles, to play? The sir mark? No. No? Yeah, I didn't think so. It's okay. Oh, okay. So we'll have a link to it right up here if you're watching on YouTube. Not a big deal. Uh, right. If you're on Facebook, you can look back to the last live video we did yesterday where we did um, a Surmark marking of this. Now, a little bit what we're going to talk about with uh, not only the rotaries, but really uh, we wanted to talk about, um, I guess, backing up a little bit. I kind of jumped the gun here and went right into the second block, but we'll just do that block first and we'll go back. All right. All right. So as we're talking about the rotaries, um, there's really... Um, the big three are the truck friction and uh, the friction for the hobby. Those are like a three rotors we yeah. offer now. For the hobby series, we don't have a truck rotary available, which is one of the big advantages of why you get a pro machine, right? Because we have the more industrial rotary devices available, and especially use of the truck, which you also have an option for on the fiber, which I believe we have a video of that. Okay, let's go to that. <laughs> There we go. So here you can see the truck rotary not only can go on the inside, but also clasp on the outside of something like these um, cans, we, uh, these water bottles we have here. Um, this is done on the top of a uh, metal bracket here. The fiber laser, um, I guess this is just the fiber, not the chuck uh, in this part of the video. Here it is on the uh, other part. Um, this uh, is holding now on the back side of the cup, which... Yeah, it looks like it's floating. Absolutely, but with using the truck like that, not only to have a quick release and switch out, but using the fiber, we're talking minutes per cup rather than, or really, I mean, each one of those cups, there I think, go. take three minutes, right? Like on this one, this is three minutes a cup. Yeah. And that was for multiple passes, too. That was not just a single yeah, pass. Yeah, you'll see this one's done, but it's still going over it. So. Absolutely. So that was like a cleanup pass. So you're you're really shedding, you know, you know, four, five, sometimes ten times the time off your engravings on your cups. Now, uh, with this... Uh, um, uh, mug you did here, you, uh, why don't you walk people through how you uh, d uh, went through this process? So this has a kind of a long process because we're using the CO2 that doesn't traditionally mark metal. This is a bare st stainless steel mug and you have to add Surmark on top of that. All right, we'll talk about the Surmark here in just a second. Why don't you talk about uh, the process of it attaching and then okay. putting the, um, the file on a rounded object like that and maybe getting the size for it and how you uh, figured that out. Okay, so it's going to be different for your traditional rotary and then the chuck. Okay. So with the chuck, you're going to put your guy in there and then use your uh, the actual chuck to open it. And it's actually going to open and tighten that on there. And it also and can close down on top of something smaller, for instance, if you had a small yeah. uh, lid like that. So then you're going to just... What I do is I always butt this end up against the machine. So you have a nice square edge. Nice square edge, so this isn't going to be off uh, straight. And then in the software, you're going to enable the rotary, enable the chuck rotary, 
And then you're going to take the measurement of your object. This was uh, 2.76 uh, inches. I punch that in, and then I take my design in, and I just rotate it 90 degrees. So the thing you have to consider, though, if you want to take that off the truck real quick, is you yeah. have um, not only the height of your design on there to consider, but then you have to figure uh, with the circumference of your cup. So like this cup, for instance, you would take um, the circumference uh, total of the cup and apply that to be the width of your uh, rectangle. So this um, this file here um, is, what did you say, about three inches, four inches tall? And yeah. then uh, what did you say on the width? The width, uh, that was actually 3.2. So as you can see, uh, with the width, he had plenty of room and even some extra room uh, on the edge if you wanted to go a little bit bigger. But he put a nice, perfect placement on the center of this one, which another reason why the truck rotary is so easy to use because you can kind of get the placement really perfect, um, really in the first try. Um, the sizing of this too, as you're designing it, um, if you're trying to go all the way around, what would be the best uh, practice for like a, a wine glass if you want to put a pattern all the way around the edge? All the way around it, so you'll take your circumference like you said, and then what I do is make a rectangle and design in there. Now you're going to want that to match up, or you can cleverly take your design and make it so you don't have to match up perfectly, because that is quite difficult right. to get that measurement uh, precise. So sometimes what I do is I'll do like a ribbon design, and then on the end of it, I'll do an emblem. And then when it comes all together, it's a ribbon and then the emblem, the emblem in the front. Gotcha. And so where the, the two seams line up isn't on the emblem, though, but it's on the band that connects the emblem, right? So that it's kind of hidden? Yeah, yeah. So it actually it won't even, it won't even uh, touch each other because the emblem meets. Ah, meets so it's side. like if you're looking at a rectangle, it's design and then ribbon. So once it wraps all the way around, it almost meets that center logo. Perfect. So with the Chuck uh, rotary, um, it's pretty easy to use. It's pretty straightforward as far as how it connects. But what are some things people can remember using the friction rotary? That's what most people have out in the field. So the friction rotary is good for, like you said, wine glasses, uh, wine bottles. A lot of people do like commemorative bottles because that's kind of a cool thing to do. Um, and when he says commemorative bottles, uh, what he means is, let's say you had a, an event coming up and someone bought a case of wine for that. Now, it would be against the law for you to go out and buy wine bottles and mark them and then sell them third party. But if your customer buys a case of wine and then provides those bottles, they can bring them to you and you can engrave them for commemorative things. So this could be weddings, ceremonies, um, the, uh, uh, like company type things, like 10 year, 20 year anniversary for things, uh, yeah. people's retirements, uh, anniversaries, different things like that. So uh, whether it's a wine bottle, a bottle of uh, liquor, uh, like a bottle of scotch, a lot of people like to gift uh, around the Christmas times. Uh, you can put commemorative things there, gift things, um, you know, messages, uh, you know, a toast, if you will. Uh, so that's kind of what uh, they mean by marking bottles. Yeah, and this one is good for, because you're not going to grab glass with this oh, guy. Oh, of course not, yeah. No, uh, and just sitting this on the friction right here is very nice for uh, more delicate things. Absolutely. Now, some people have taped off their glass and used the, the truck before, but the I, I think the problem people find with it is that it's not really designed, for the, it's really designed to have a nice firm grip. Like, you really want to have to, a nice... I don't want to say a uh, over tightened grip, but you want to have enough there where there's no slippage, right? Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't want it slipping or moving, or even just if it slips and then breaks your project. That's not right. cool. Absolutely. So uh, when you had to mark this tumbler, uh, you were mentioning you use Surmark. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll circle back around to right. a little bit of that. Sorry. Uh, so this aluminum normally wouldn't be marked uh, with a you know a CO2 laser, right? Because the uh, frequency just wouldn't have any effect on the metal. Uh, but what you do is you put on the surmark, and what happens uh, on the surface then, Walker? So it's a, a chemical reaction where it's going through the surmark and then actually placing that material onto the top of the steel. Now, that's not actually etching anything. There's no depth there. Right, you can uh, actually feel it's a little, there's a little bit of uh, texture almost on top. Yeah, where it's actually rise because yeah. it's adding a layer. Right. It's a really an, a layer of oxidation, right? Yeah, it's a, and it's permanent. You know, or, you know, permanent enough. You could probably sand this off. Yeah, you but could it would sand take it that off. extent to get it off, right? Yeah, it's going to be on there for quite a long time. Now, the Surmark is great for marking unmarked things if you have a CO2. Now, there's two types of Surmark, right? There's spray and, like, a brush-on. Well, yeah, you have your brush-on, which is good for smaller type uh, situations where you need to get into, like, a nook or cranny. 
and then you have your spray which this stuff has to go on extremely evenly for you to get a good marking so the spray is the best and uh, you'll do traditional spray strokes like you would any good spray paint job um, and they also have tape as well it's a demo <laughs> yeah they have tape as well so if you have something that's just a specific size you can put the tape on there and then not have to worry about it being so even yeah really the tape is your best option if you want uh, the ease of use because not only is it perfectly uh, applied across it but mm. there's no mess there's no cleaning up afterwards which is probably my only complaint using Surmark is it's a little messy there's the after uh, the post processing part of it which as you can see like on the bottom of the cup Walker used uh, the bottom to dial in the power settings here, and I think it's going to have to go in the center to focus. I think it's focused on your face. I'm focusing here. What do we? Oh, whatever. Okay, so on the bottom of the cup, we basically turn the cup upside down on the laser and mark the bottom of the cup a few times to get a good mark. Now you can see, um, and we'll take we'll share a picture of this um, in the comments. A few of the marks are a little faint, uh, and yeah. then some of them are a little blown past. Uh, so dialing in the power is really essential with Surmark. Yeah, and there was probably twice as many power set like power setting tests on that as you can visually see because the Surmark will actually mark, but it won't leave it onto the ma the material. So once you wash it away, it it's goes crazy. away. You can see all the blank areas there. That was completely filled with FSL. Like none of those spaces in between or bottom to the bottom left there uh, were empty. Like he had marked up the entire bottom to get the, the settings in. Um, when you dial it in there and you find the marks, it's consistent. There's no variation yeah. with it. Once you've kind of found your sweet spot, uh, what did you find the sweet spot was for the 90 watt? So the 90 watt, the 24 uh, by 16, it was 22 power, 100 speed. 1,000 DPI. 1,000 DPI. Now, let's talk about DPI because really um, it's a little bit different uh, when you're marking things. And DPI applies to not only marking uh, surmark things like this, but also coated surfaces. So when you're t taking the coating off of a surface, kind of like uh, my water bottle here has the coating taken off of it, this is actually technically uh, the coating removed from this as well. And then even if you're marking like your MacBook, uh, this is... Even on the MacBook, as you can see, that is technically just removing the anodized aluminum coating there on the MacBook. So you put up the uh, the DPI to 500 or 1,000. Um, why? Because uh, because you want more detail, or uh, with the Surmark, yeah, or it, even on a coated surface. Um, so you want to be able to remove it for sure, because these t uh, types of coatings are actually really bonded on there nicely. Right. So giving it that extra pass with the DPI is beneficial. And it's kind of the same science with Surmark, right? Yeah, it's and it's not going to activate if you don't have enough power uh, applied to it at one given time. So, you and you want it to bond, or else it's just going to wash away. Absolutely. So, with the higher DPI's, um, you're literally overlapping uh, your layers of resolution when you're at a thousand DPI. There's a slight overlap with 500 DPI, but it's really uh, negligible. With five, oh, with a thousand, there's a lot of overlap, uh, especially with your spot size. If you have a 1.5 inch lens with a smaller spot size, there's less overlap. But it's almost more essential to do a thousand DPI when you have the 1.5 inch lens. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So. Uh, when you're doing coated uh, engravings, uh, another thing to think about is also um, uh, solid fill and uh, and dithered, right? Like most of the time you want to do a solid fill engraving for coated, uh, almost always exclusively for Surmark. But some people can get away with doing uh, some photos and dithered work on coated material. But what's the secret there? It's kind of the opposite, right? Yeah, it's not so much power. Right. Um, you're well, not so much DPI, uh, lower yeah, DPI. Yeah. Right? Lower DPI and, and power as well because you can get some blowout. Right. And that's one thing. It, c it comes down to your power settings because you'll get some blowout and then also fuzzing where it actually, where it's leaving the surmark. Right. So uh, you really have to dial it in. And if there's too much power, you can actually not only uh, kind of blow out the design, but you can completely remove it so the laser is actually blasting th through, through the, the surmark, surmark and, and just removing, removing the oxidation it. yeah because technically if you put a piece of rusted metal into the laser you could clean that metal with the co2 laser correct yeah yeah like technically yeah, it's yeah. not going to be easy you're going to have to it's gonna, it. yeah it's, it's uh, literally the hardest way possible it, i was going like to say the, ineffective yeah, the most yeah. ineffective hardest way possible but you would do it so um photos are kind of difficult then when you say dithered wise yeah, uh, I've seen people do it, and I'm actually surprised how well it's yeah, gone. I just out. saw a puppy done on a black yeah, mark yeah, that looked uh, pretty incredible. Yeah, and I'm, and they even said like I had to dial in my power settings, yep. right? Like, and I believe it because I've tried it, and 
it to me it doesn't come out super awesome looking yeah. and my patience is gone you know <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely i think that's the biggest secret with engraving in general whether it's uh, engraving on a piece of wood with a photo or anything else it's really filing uh, finding the dial in settings uh, for that piece of material um, i've noticed a lot with uh, 500 dpi dithered photo engravings on wood that the density of the wood really vi really plays with how detailed uh, your photo will come out. So if you have a very dense wood, you don't get a ton of detail and you kind of have to have uh, more power, slower speeds. But with really soft wood, like a poplar, you can actually run pretty high speed, pretty low power, and mm. still get all the detail you need. And really, when you do the soft words with higher power, you kind of lose some of the detail because like you said, it gets a little too blown out. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of variables. like. With ply, sometimes it comes out amazing, and then sometimes you'll like go through the glue, or and like the, just the dark parts hit the uh, second layer, and yeah. so like some of it looks amazing, then just the darker parts have hit the other layer, and it's like oh yeah. my god, the worst. And then solid wood, sometimes you'll hit like a grain or, or like a knot, a knot yeah, and absolutely. it just looks terrible. So. Yeah. And that's what's horrible is you'll get like this nice piece of wood and yeah. if you want to raster it and it's got this knot right in the middle. Yeah, I'm very picky about my material when I'm picking it up uh, at the store. I pick it out, I set it on the floor to make sure it's flat. I look for different knots and variables in it. If there's a seam in it that I can see like where the two boards were together, I don't buy that piece of wood. I'm pretty picky. There's times I've gone to uh, like Joann's or Hobby Lobby and just not bought it any because I, oh, I just didn't have oh, any. Yeah. The, the worst is like my brother's like, hey man, I got some wood for you to cut. Oh, yeah. I got this project, yeah. and then he hands me this piece of wood that's it's all bent. It's like I was just like, cool, man. <laughs> Nautical grade plywood and like all the glue in it. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. the worst. Didn't you say you could cut a half inch? Well, yeah, it, it yeah. can. It's bowed. Yeah, <laughs> but you can cut a half inch flat. Not yeah, a half inch good. Uh, so what else we got uh, on the agenda? Looks like we do have a uh, pretty cool contest winner this week. Uh, oh yeah, uh, Sandra. Um, oh, it looks like we have a couple questions coming. Let's we'll go to those questions after we get to the contest winner. Sandra Frey Benson. There we go. So hey. <laughs> Charles, I hope man, our producer Charles. He, <coughs> if you get a chance, leave him a cookie or something on his desk because we put him through the ringer sometimes. Yeah. Like, we went completely oh, no. out of order. No, the show, change completely it. back, and then I mean, we get in, we go right out. Sandra right, Benson. Back to Sandra Benson. Congratulations. Uh, this is terrific. Uh, this is a multi-layer. You talked about this a couple weeks ago, using cuts and engravings, multi-layer. Yeah, she, it's a couple weeks late, but it works. Um, actually, I met Sandra Benson, uh, and she's really nice. And she does, i got to get in frame so I can see this. Uh, uh, she actually does, what is that, uh, scrapbooking. So oh, yeah. And I'm surprised how big scrapbooking is. It's still it's huge. Yeah. yeah. Go to Joanne's, there's like three aisles of it. It's I know, incredible. it's nuts. Yeah. But she's doing great with her laser and paper. So congratulations, Sandra. Another great job. That's a couple paper winners in a row. Uh, that was pretty good. Paper's a cool one. I like yeah. paper. Um, I like paper because you can add little details to bigger things. And it costs nothing. Nothing. Yeah, you can get a ream of paper for five bucks. Okay, so Jeff Hayes. When engraving glass, do you recommend glass tape or coating the glass before engraving? Great question, Jeff, as always. So glass is finicky. And really, if, uh, if there's ever a time where quality of material comes into play, it's definitely in glass. Um, new glass, uh, especially new cheap glass, the density is very, very low. You'll, you can see when it's broken. You can see how it breaks. Um, older, thicker glass definitely engraves better. Um, thicker, nicer glass obviously engraves better. But really, it's about the density of the glass. Now, with the surface, you got to remember, you are basically scratching uh, the the surface of the glass so you are not necessarily making a deep engraving into it and you don't ever want to overpower your glass and make yeah. it so where it's flaking and coming off now yeah. this can happen from two different reasons it can kind of happen from too much power it can also happen from it being too dry so depending on the type of glass you have you could get more success from putting a wet cloth uh, to one single layer thin wet cloth wet though completely over top the glass or coating the glass. I've seen people even do things like a little bit of coconut oil on the glass to help keep it down and keep the moisture on it so you get a good clean engraving. Yeah, I've seen people take a wet paper towel and I've, I've actually tried it and wrap it around the glass and then run the job and you'll see that the edge is a little better um, but it's not going to be as much of an engraving, if that makes sense, like the contrast. Yeah, you have to fight through the uh, paper towels. So you have to consider that as well. And then you also have to remember that the uh, moisture that's in there is being involved in the vaporization process. So that's also going to affect your beam just a little bit. Um, 
The other thing I think uh, is a good tip on the glass tip is using rubber bands around the edges of your glasses so that mm -hmm. a rubber band is what's touching the uh, friction rotary. Uh, many times when people are doing glasses, uh, they notice they'll slip a little bit and they'll say, you know, the file is skewed or the software messed up or something went wrong like that. And a lot of times it's just the glass is slipping a little bit. Uh, looks like we have some hellos to get to. So sorry, guys. Jim Robinson, what's up? How you doing, buddy? Jeff up, from Jim? St. Louis, how you doing again? Jason Cry, good afternoon to you, sir. Uh, Waterford, Michigan, how you doing, John? Go blue, buddy. Um, then we got, um, and then Dennis Salander. There we go. How what's you up, doing, guys? guys? Thanks so much for tuning in, everybody. Um, looks like we got a couple more questions coming in from the other side. Uh, Jill asks, Surmark is sort of expensive. Would it be better to just buy a fiber laser? Yes, of course. <laughs> well, Jill, I'll say absolutely because we sell fiber lasers and we don't sell Surmark. But uh, if we're looking at just an economical standpoint, and we can actually show you another um, ROI example that we had uh, that Charles actually uh, made up for us again. But mm -hmm. speaking on specifically this question, Jill, you got to imagine for twice as much money, um, you get a ten thousand dollar fiber laser, and you're able to engrave four times as fast. Now that simple equation could tell you that you could simply make more tumblers faster but you're also making a higher quality of tumbler. You're also being able to engrave up to 10 times more accurate than you would using the CO2. So you're four times faster, 10 times more accurate, and your footprint is so much more small. You don't have to worry about coolant, so you don't have uh, like a bucket or any sort of chiller to worry about. Your exhaust is almost none. You can have the smallest exhaust fan just pouring out. A lot mm -hmm. of people don't even exhaust it. They just or have just a... F just blow on it. Yeah, they just have a light little fan sitting next to it just blowing yeah. the little bit of dust that comes off away. Uh, and then some people have just a little small uh, FS100 fume extractor whose, uh, you know, the, the filters never have to be changed because no. it's just, you know, <laughs> Very little I don't think we've ever changed the filters ever on our fume extractor for our fiber lasers, uh, which maybe we should write that down. Yeah, write Frankie. That down that. Um, but the, I mean, the compact fiber, you have two options. You have a closed system, which you could do a lot of little stuff, and it's a completely closed off. You don't have to worry about any kind of safety things, your eyes at all. Then we have an open system that you can do tons of huge things anything from tumblers to you know weapons to uh, knives to everything else i mean it's pretty impressive like and you all get the cool glasses with really it. cool glasses not as cool as those white glasses the other guys give yeah, you yeah. But, but they're pretty cool <coughs> uh, uh dennis how, how's it going sir uh good to see you uh tuning in again uh looks like we have one more question from the other side as well uh roman in arizona asking Will extreme summer heat affect the laser tube's CO2 gas? Well, I mean, heat does affect gases, period. So, like, of course, the heat will obviously make the gas expand a little bit. Will affect the effectiveness of your laser? Uh, of course it will a little bit because you don't want your laser tube to be running warm. Um, but as long as your coolant is running through your tube, yeah. you, you should be fine. So Just buy a chiller and you're good. Absolutely. Monitor the cool, uh, the temperature of your water. Now, if you can't afford a chiller, not a big deal. Just in your water bucket, like you can do a bunch of different things. Uh, keep Save water bottles. Uh, keep frozen water bottles full of water in your uh, bucket. That honestly is going to keep it cooler than a chiller would anyway if you can keep that full. Um, other little things you can do, and you can just keep, uh, you can get one of those dollar stick-on temperature gauges and just stick it on the inside of your water bucket so you can keep an eye on it. Uh, summertime temperatures are definitely something to be concerned with with your tube, uh, but as long as you have a coolant uh, running through it, uh, you should be fine. Uh, looks like uh, Amy's asking right here in Las Vegas, which rotary goes with Whisper Machine? Um, well, basically there's two options for pro and there's a single option for hobby. So the hobby has a uh, friction, friction it's a little bit uh, smaller, than, smaller this. than this, obviously, yeah. so it can fit in the same laser. Concept. But it's basically the same exact concept, uh, and they have wheels on the bottom that the um, object sits on. And then the Pro also has a chuck rotary, which is also available for the uh, uh, fiber uh, lasers as well. So that's another beautiful thing about the fiber lasers above getting a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a, instead of a hobby laser. You can get two hobby lasers for the price of a single fiber laser, sure, but even with both of those running nonstop, you can never go faster than a single fiber laser. That's the thing I think is the bare bones argument. If I was just doing tumblers, if that was my main goal, getting a laser, yeah. I wouldn't even consider getting a CO2 laser. There's tons of pr useful things a CO2 laser does that would make me want one that a fiber laser could never do. Yeah, I would say it's more versatile. Absolutely, much more versatile. Like, you, like I, I wouldn't pick it over the other, but if my only purpose was doing tumblers, or yes. knives or whatever, hands down, wouldn't even consider the CO2. Would definitely yeah. go for the fiber. A lot, lot of work. A lot of work for that. Yeah, and um, 
there's just so much post process with CO2 um, when you're marking metals. Um, mm -hmm. Looks like we have, uh, oh man, we got some Nevada people checking in. Uh, what's up, state of Nevada? Uh, Surmark safe for children to use. Uh, let me see. It says edible on there. Does it? No. Um, so I would um, say for children, that's probably not uh, for young children. I would say this is probably under parental supervision. Mm, maybe under danger is what it says. Uh, there was oh, a it's flammable. Yeah, there's a handful of dangers. Flammable, do not eat, do not get in eyes. So Make sure to shake this stuff up, too, because it likes to settle. It's settled. Well, yeah, it's, um, it's uh, suspended in isopropanol. So yeah, what's weird, though, is you can mix isopropyl alcohol or water into it to make it work. Really? Yeah, Strange. I thought that was weird. Yeah. Well, probably both evaporate close enough at the same rate, especially with the laser. I don't know. Tell that to my dad. I used to leave the IPA open for a second. Oh, He'd be like, it's oh, going to be it's gone it's in a second. It's basically done in 10 minutes. Yeah, I remember that. Wasted a dollar. So Gary in Nome, Alaska, hey, back up where you're from. Uh, what is a Z table and what does a, t a Z table? So a Z table is not a mm -hmm. thing necessarily. It's a, uh, it's a function or a part of a, uh, of a laser. So the Z table is your Z height. So it's basically the, the bed that your material sits on. And having a motorized Z table in the Pro Series means that you have not only a bed that you can rise and lower for the thickness of your material, but means you can also put in much larger objects, much thicker yeah. things. So you can put the Z table down uh, eight inches, actually. So it's your Z axis, and then the X and the Y is the actual gantry. And I say Z because that's what the British say, and I think it sounds cooler. This guy. <laughs> Okay, looks like we got one more question coming in. Uh, Shane in Grand Island, Nebraska. Are there any islands in Nebraska, and are any of them grand? Just kidding, people in Nebraska, just kidding. Okay, so Shane in Grand Island, uh, should I put my honeycomb tray in the riser or leave it out when using my Muse rotary? Well, it depends on your use. Um, if you're doing stuff in the bottom of the bed, I would put it down there. Uh, and then if you had the floor back on and you're using it regularly, uh, I would use on, it yeah. as well. Depends on your application. What yeah. if you need it just that quarter inch higher? Yeah. Um, and uh, honestly, I take the, uh, the honeycomb out many times in the muse so I can put something in that's a little bit taller. That gives you an extra, yeah. you know, almost half inch of uh, Z height there. Uh, Williams, I guess, just coming in with a quick question. Uh, oh, Jim Robinson looks like he had a question. Would you check on my 1.5 lens? Ordered it a couple weeks ago and have not heard. I did talk to sales Friday, but no reply. Jim Robinson, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to check on that as soon as this show's done. Yeah, um, we'll do that. Right now. Uh, so expect uh, within 10 minutes after the show's done to have an answer about that. Should call out which salesman. Yeah, oh, we will. <coughs> um, if Yeah, Jim, do you have uh, do you have a salesman in mind? Because if any of them are watching, the sales manager's watching, probably they'll probably just uh, have them call actually during mm -hmm. the show. So if you got that name, uh, let us know, <coughs> Jim, and we'll pass it to him <laughs> while we're going here. Um, Scott, oh, scroll stuff. Oh, scroll stuff. What's up, scroll stuff? Thanks for tuning in, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, looks like uh, we have... Where do I find Walker project files on the things he makes on the shows? Great. So on Friday, you're making a few things. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But where do we find all your other projects you've uh, come up with? The website. Oh, yeah, laser101.fslaser.com. Very easy. If you go to our main web, uh, website, fslaser.com, just look in the top, Laser 101. Look under free projects. He's got not only nine projects to walk you through how to use your laser, so if you're completely uh, new and you just want to learn how to engrave pictures and cut out things and make boxes and do simple things, nine projects that walk you through how to do basically everything a laser can do. And then I think we're up to 74. Yeah. 74 free projects uh, to make everything from uh, da Vinci flying machines to card holders to what do we got this week? We've got uh, name tags. Fun name tags. So name tags for <coughs> it could be for different events, could be back to school, could be. Yeah. I, on Friday, I did say we we're going to do a whole month of light fixtures, remember? But then you were like, nobody likes light fixtures like you do. So now yeah. what we're doing yeah. is we were going to do a whole month, but we're just going to spread those light fixtures out because yeah. Cindy Garcia made a great light yes. fixture, right? That we'll put on the link to that in the corner. You can see how to make that one. You just made a light fixture. Yeah. You just don't want to put too many light fixtures. I know. I, I was just in the zone. In the zone. Light yeah. fixture. But if it means anything, guys, we have some other cool lights coming. Yeah. Usually yeah. we have a cool Dead. desktop light, yeah. uh, another pendant light coming out, and a cool, a couple cool edge lit LED lights. We know a lot of people love those. Yeah. And gonna, uh, Walker's going to show a quick demonstration of how easy it is to not only make yes, the LED anything. light, but also the base, right? Yeah, the base as well. A lot of people buy those. Yeah, a lot of people, those bases are like 25 bucks. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and y like, I think the cheapest one, if you buy a couple, it turns out to be like 16 or something. Yeah. So it's it's still significant, and it's just a couple of circles cut with a laser Absolutely. and some yeah, LEDs. And then an LED strip, which uh, you get a whole roll of LEDs, which you could probably do 20 or 30 signs of those, and they're like 20 bucks a kit. They're nothing. Um, yeah. And then all you really need is either a... Uh, I guess 1.5 volt supply or a, um, a battery uh, power pack for it. Yeah, yeah. A lot of those come with the actual packs too. So yeah, the ones you can buy from the the pre-made ones. Oh, just just oh, LED, LED strip, uh, LED strip uh, with a plug. Yeah, but if you're doing it bulk wise, you'd probably buy the big roll of LEDs and cut parts. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. Right. and then and then plug the little yeah, guys on. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so either way, you can save some money making your own. Uh, either way, Walker will not only make a bunch of awesome lamps, but also those edge light ones. So yeah, yeah. All of that's coming down the line. Don't think we are shying away from our lamp. Excuse me, jeez, I've been drinking too much of this water. Hey, hey. Okay. Shirley Temple. So, uh, yeah, too many Shirley Temples. <laughs> on the um, so, uh, looks like we also have one. Oh, Dennis, uh, looks like a question. Got my Gen 5 a few years ago. Uh, back, no issues. Uh, with all, glad I went with FSL. Dennis, thanks so much, man. Yeah. Uh, so, I'll, I'll read that one more time. <coughs> I kind of mumbled through it. Uh, but Dennis is saying, got my fifth gen laser a few years ago. Back, uh, back a five a few years ago. No issues with it at all. Glad I went with FSL. Dennis, thank you so much. I appreciate the kind words. Uh, glad you're making some stuff for the laser. Should enter the weekly contest yes. and get a new uh, focus lens for your uh, your five uh, your Gen Five. Or two hundred fifty dollars off your next your next purchase. laser. Absolutely, you get a new one. Uh, that contest runs every week. All you have to do is put the hashtag. Uh, FSL Weekly Contest, oh, yeah. post a picture, and you're entered. It's that easy. Looks like Jim Robinson's got one coming in. I did the edge light on the beta walker. Did absolutely, Jim. Yeah, if you guys want to look one. back on a post on our page, um, Jim actually took one of Walker's projects and transformed it into an edge light LED, which was yeah. awesome. I, I was hoping somebody was going to do that because yeah. I mentioned, oh, you could use this uh, in different ways. And it's good to see that you can take a project and make it your own you know, even if it's just a different material or you've just remixed it completely, like, that's cool to know people do that. Absolutely. And a lot of times you can just put engravings on the projects you've made to personalize it, whether it's the picture frames, uh, whether it's uh, even the pendant light, you could personalize even the inside patterns. Of oh, that, yeah. Right? You could just remove all those inside patterns and then just put whatever you want. You put your logo on the inside of that, a different pattern. You could put uh, your baby's name. Um, Weird silhouette of faces on there. Be cool. Know about that. <laughs> what if they're shining on the wall? Oh, that would be kind of creepy. A bunch of little faces all yeah. over the wall. Oh, doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> That'd be cool. That would be kind of cool. So, um, if you could please give us a like, follow, subscribe on our other social media fronts. We're trying to gain our Instagram followership up there. We do a bunch of fun stuff on Instagram. Give a follow over on that side. Uh, make sure you check out our Laser 101 weekly contest, all that type of stuff that we have going on there. Um, Friday on the uh, the name tags. Uh, what do you think the most fun shape is you have for the name tags right now? Mm, my favorite is the classic "Hello, my name is" because I don't know why I just want to put like "Hello, my name is Slim Shady," something dorky on there. And then you could also like take that little name tag, expand it, and put "Hello, my name is," and then like this is so and so's room or something. Make it a sign rather Absolutely. than a name tag. So that's probably my favorite. I like the ones you have that are going to be for the EDU, so the teachers can have and use for their students. I think that's yeah, a couple yeah. cool ones. The little there. spelling, I've got a little spelling B. Yeah, I love the spelling like, B one, the uh, spelling B champ. That's a great one because you can do that weekly, you know, because every week yeah. you have a spelling test in elementary school. And weekly, weekly student or whatever, yeah. like, we'll see if we can do monthly, weekly. Yeah. Oh, kids usually it's a weekly, weekly thing. thing yeah. yeah, I think that's probably the best thing about having a laser in your school and EDU systems is, yeah, you can use it for STEM. Uh, that's obvious. How do you use a laser? How does a laser use? Yeah. That's very obvious. It's also pretty obvious that you know you can use it for different things inside the classroom, like making you know maps or parts or pieces or puzzles or whatever. But really, the things you can do to enhance your classroom mm -hmm. through awarding your students, personalizing things for your students, uh, making uh, different lesson plans more involved. Imagine having a Lewis and Clark uh, lesson and then you cutting out pieces of the Louisiana Purchase and putting it together. So as they travel across the country, you're literally pushing, putting together the puzzle of the different things on the back side engraved is like some information about that portion of their trip or what have you. I'm riffing on that idea. Teachers find a better idea and do a better job than that. Yeah. But you kind of know what I mean. Um, we've seen some teachers take skeleton parts and have little bags and the kids can put together the skeletons yeah. and all the bones are labeled and the kids can color the bones. They have different sections. 
different things like that really enhance uh, a student's experience in the classroom. Like, there's only so much a book can teach you. There's only so much that slides can show you. There's only so much that videos can do you. When you actually have the physical thing in your hand, mm -hmm. you remember so much more. At least I do. I think it may be a little plight of the artist, but, uh, you know, it's the cross we carry. Tangibility is always good. Tangible things are huge. But the other thing with EDU is doing uh, fundraisers. If you can imagine having a bunch of these at your uh, homecoming game, and instead of having full spectrum laser, you have your school logo. And then on the back, you offer an engraving of putting every student's individual name, position, and graduation year on the back. You can have parents lined up for days at the hot dog stand getting their kids engraved on that. Uh, <laughs> like every, every that student. That hot dog stand's got a laser. <laughs> <laughs> um, that'd be pretty funny. Yeah. Um, but you know what I mean. Uh, so different fundraisers, whether it's at football games, uh, parent-teacher events, uh, what have you, being able to personalize things from mugs to yearbooks uh, to... Oh, um, yeah, yearbook one's huge. I remember it was like $10 to, to get the just, plaque, the just the name, name on it. Now, yeah. imagine being able to engrave on everyone's right on the cover. That's incredible. You yeah. Know what I mean? And then really, too, uh, even the maintenance staff at a school can redo the, the teacher name plaques of every door in one day's of work uh, on the laser. Yeah, the bathroom signs. Yeah, bath uh, and we do that yeah. here at work. We have some fun ones. Uh, you actually have a project with fun bathroom signs, don't I you? I do. Yep. So I think it's project number 26. That you do not I know I do not that. know that. <laughs> I made that up. Oh, okay. man. That would have been pretty good if I did. It's scary. Um, it would have been terrifying if I did, actually. Uh, so we also have the, um, as always, we have the survey. Links are down below. Uh, you probably got the survey after you bought your laser, too. Give us a second. Uh, let us know what you think. We always take that feedback, good and bad, uh, to heart. Uh, if you think we're doing something good, please let us know so we can do more of it. If you think we could be a little bit better someplace, let us know that too because we'd love to, uh, you know, fill in the gaps where we can. Uh, Jim called out Joe for us, so we'll we'll have to talk Joe. to Joe. Oh, I'll tell you what, Jim, I'm gonna go and talk to Joe right now. And we'll get that lens. We're gonna get that lens. We're gonna make sure that's out. Um, I can almost guarantee that gets shipped. If it's not today, it'll be the first thing in the morning. Um, uh, what else we have? I need to send in one of my... Oh, yeah, Dennis, definitely submit one of your projects, man. Uh, looking forward to see what you're making. Jim said an uh, edge-lit light of Walker's face would be cool. Edge-lit. <laughs> no. I think we have our first super fan for you. Oh, man. Uh, so the that, walk, that would if you'd be like funny. to sign up for the Walker fan club, <laughs> the phone number is right down below. That would be super funny, though. <laughs> um, maybe that's what we can do, uh, the marketing team. I'll sadly it. give that to my mom just as she misses me. That's pretty funny. Oh, man. I could do the changing light LEDs down below, and you can tell that it's a mood, that as your mood changes, the colors change down below. Or I can double, like, oh, man, have you seen those where it's like a two different engravings, one behind the other, and then the LED uh, swaps, so the face changes? Change, yeah, it's oh, really man. cool. That'd be really neat. Um, other than that, I think that's all we have for this week. So if you have any more questions about rotary devices or engraving uh, coded services, uh, make sure you leave a question for us uh, over in the comments or down below. We'll answer those right away. Mm -hmm. um, once again, if you want to see this cup be engraved, it's our last live video on our Facebook page here. Go check it out. It's a real cool video. Walker does a great job talking about the Surmark. If you want a little more information about that before, we also have a great blog, which we'll put a link down below. If not, we will make sure we have it down in the comments of YouTube but uh, our uh, staff writer, Scott, who always has great information for us on our websites and on our one-hour builds on Friday, he's put together a great blog about the Surmark. Uh, if you're looking for more information on that, the video will also be in that blog, so look for that. Um, I think that's all we got for this week, man. And that Pretty was good. a lot. We that covered was a lot. it. Yeah, kind of killed it. All right, so until next week, uh, you'll see us here on Laser Talk, but until Friday, we have Walker making some name tags. I'm Nick. That's Walker. Keep making. <laughs>